Good morning, everybody. We are so pleased that you've been able to join us this morning. How many of you enjoyed your extra hour in bed this morning? Yeah? Great. Well, just to give you a heads up of what is going to be happening this morning, my name is Paul, um, and I am the next-gen pastor here. And what that means is I look after all the things to do with kids and young people. And this morning, we're going to be here for the next 75 minutes. And as we do, we're going to be taking some time to worship. And what I mean by that is we're going to be singing songs to God. And what will happen is the words will come up on the screen as the band that leads us in them. And if you feel comfortable to stand on your feet and sing along, you can do. But as we start today's service, I just want to give you a little thought for this morning. So can I invite everyone to stand up for me? I just want to read some words of scripture to you that the Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians. It says this, Give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his Son of his the son of who he loves, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. This is the God we worship this morning. This is the God that we're going to be singing these songs to, the one who created everything, the one who created you and me, and he loves us. So as the band leaders, I want to encourage us to sing our hearts out because he is a God who sings over us.
We've got some reasons to praise God this morning. Yeah, so I don't know if many of you know, but Simon and Joe introduced somebody new to their family this week. Baby Iris. She was born on Friday. She was seven pounds, 15 ounces, because I know that's important to people. Okay, but everybody is doing well. Isn't that a reason to praise God this morning? Some of you might know yesterday that there was an, um, an alpha weekend here, okay? And as they did, they had somebody new make a decision to follow Jesus. They've had four people over the course of so far who've made a recommitment to follow God. And 
during their time yesterday, each of them had an amazing time with Holy Spirit. Isn't that a reason to praise God this morning? Yeah, we've just had another one from Tom and Jennifer just saying how about how their friend Rachel, who visited the church a couple of weeks ago, um, she was, I'm trying to read this now, um, she had a surgery last week and she is doing well, she is recovering and is, um, is on her way home and she wants to give thanks for everybody who prayed for her. Isn't this another reason to praise God this morning? Like, I know that I repeat it, and I repeat it over and over, but there's a verse in Revelations 2, which talks about how the power of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb is the thing that overcomes Satan. And, and we've got some here, we've got some reasons to pray this morning. So if people can gather around some of the people I'm going to name as they pray and as we pray for some people, um, Louise Moynihan, if you want to gather around Louise's, she and others can pray for Shannon, Sharon and Roger and the whole family because some of you might have noticed on social media this week, their son took his life on Monday. And what is going to be a horrendous and difficult time for the family, we just want to pray that God is there, God is comforting each of them. So if people can gather with the Louise and pray for the family. Lucia um, is brought to us again. Catherine. Catherine helps out here most days of the week, but Catherine's not been doing too well and is currently waiting an appointment um, for a brain scan at Walton. So if people can go with um, Lucia and pray with Lucia for Catherine, that we would find out what is wrong, that we would see healing and where there is difficulties right now. And if people can gather around Chris, Chris, I know we celebrated the other day. He's still on the transplant list, but he's waiting to find out the results of two more tests and hoping all is going well. So if people can gather around Chris as we continue to pray and continue to see God move in that situation, praying that he will get a liver transplant. See, we've got reasons to praise, but we've got reasons to pray. And I'm sure there's other people in this room who need the touch from God this morning. If that is you, if you just want to raise your hand, whether or not you need to pray for healing, whether there is a difficult situation that is going on, and have it. And as a church, we're, we're a church, but as the church, we're a royal priesthood. Each of us gets to pray for one another. So if you can see a hand that is around, you want to gather around that person, make sure that there is nobody left without someone to pray for. There's someone just at the back over there. Someone can go and join them and pray for them. Because we just want to see God move this morning. Yeah, Jesus, we thank you for what you did for us on the cross. We thank you that it is by your blood that we are healed. That is by what you've done for us that we can celebrate today. And God, we just pray again that you would come and meet with us, that you are somebody who heals. You're a God of healing. So we pray in those situations that you would heal people. We pray that for people who need comfort in this morning, that you are a comforter, that you are readily available and with us. And you know what it's like because you came to earth as a human. We thank you, Jesus, that we have a God that empathizes with our every need. God, we just thank you that you are wanting to move this morning in the lives of people. Why? Because you care. Because you love us. And you demonstrated that on the cross. And we thank you, Jesus, again, for what you can and what you will do in these people's lives. Amen. Let's continue to praise God this morning for what he can do, for the power in which he has already, because he is over all and can work in each of these situations.
Yeah, we just thank you, God. We thank you that you've come to us this morning, that you want to meet with us this morning. We thank you for what you're doing, and we just pray that you will continually talk with us this morning. Amen. Great. If you want to take a moment just to say hello to the people who are around you, give them a high five. If I can invite you all to take your seats for me. Wow, this is a rowdy bunch this morning. I've got to say that extra hours sleep's looking good on some people because most people have just arrived. But other than that, it would be more the sense of they're just not really awake normally this time on a Sunday morning. So, great. We've got a couple of notices that we want to share with you this morning. Um, The first notice is happening tonight. So, we've got our Candy Palooza happening tonight. Yes. Thank you all, by the way. Um, I have been inundated with tweets. I'm not going to tell you where they are before you all go and try and eat some of them. But we have been given so many sweets, and so I just want to thank you all for your generosity. That has been so kind. But my last thing, my last comments to do with this will be, if you can invite your friends, invite your neighbors, if you want to mention it to friends and family to come along what, for what will be just an enjoyable evening, a time in which there will be plenty of sweets, but a time where we can play games, we can get to know new people. And I've even heard that there could be candy floss and popcorn there. So please do invite those people because I do think it'll be an opportunity that not only will there be a sugar high and a crash, but there'll be a chance to actually show something different and show a different experience of what fun can look like around this time of year when people are so consumed with Halloween and things like that. And we want to show that actually we can have some good, wholesome fun and we can celebrate God as we do it. Yeah? Our second notice happens next week and that is the bonfire event. Again, invite your friends, invite your neighbors, invite everybody that you know to come along to this as we just want to bless our community. We want to create a great evening for everybody involved. And we just want to say thank you to the 50 people who have volunteered already and how much we appreciate that we've got so many people in this church who are willing to get involved. And my last little plug for the bonfire would be, can, we, can there be two more people who are willing to get involved for car parking duties? We might need an extra two people to be involved around car parking. If you're sitting there thinking, I can commit to that, I can get involved next Saturday, come and speak to Stephen Whittle, and he'll tell you a little bit more about it. But importantly, do invite people, because we're not doing this just for the fun, but we are doing it for the fun. But we want to do it in a way in which we can bless those other people and bless those people in our community. So there are notices for today, the two notices, the two things that are going on over this next week. And 
What you might not know, because you might have read something slightly different in your email, is it's going to be me who shares with you this morning. And, um, and I'm going to be sharing on something that I've called Family on Mission. Family on Mission. So I want to ask you, have you got any family traditions or values? Something you do unconsciously that you've been doing as you've grown up as a child. I, I think back for me, and this is going to be a painful thing to retell at the moment, okay, and I'll, you'll understand why. Um, but I think back to my earliest memories. My, one of my earliest memories is of football. And I, I, I remember sitting on the floor. I don't know why I was up so late, because I was six years old. It was on the 24th of April. I Googled this to make sure. But it was a game that Liverpool were playing against PSG in the Cup Winners' Cup, a trophy that doesn't even exist anymore. Okay, and show my age again. And it was a goal that was scored by a player who played for Liverpool at the time called Mark Wright. Hands off anyone remembers Mark Wright. Oh, there's a few. I'm glad. I'm glad. Mark Wright scored the second goal from a corner. And it is one goal for some reason that I just remember. It is my early, one of my earliest memories. And that was just something that became a norm. Like, it wasn't just what we did. We didn't just watch football games. But we were Liverpoolians. We were people who supported our team through thick and thin. And one of the other things I always remember growing up is I'd see my mum go out each week to rainbows or brownies. My dad, we would often pick him up from Aintree Hospital where he volunteered for a couple of times a week for years. And like in our household, volunteering was something I saw happen all the time. It was something my parents did continuously. And as I got older, it wasn't just something for my parents anymore, but they got me involved too. My mum brought me along, and I know this is weird, but she made me do some things with the brownies, like get, show them about science experiments and all these things to the brownies. My dad would drag me along, and I would say drag, because I don't know if I was a big fan of this one, but sitting in the foyer of Aintree Hospital, helping them, trying to raise money. But volunteering wasn't just something we did, but it was a value we had as a family. And it's these traditions and values that have led me to where I am today. It's because of the journey that they've taken me on, how they've informed my choices, and how it's taught me has made me who I am today. And it's led me to ask a question. And this is the question. How do we move from tasks that we do to a way of living? How do we move from tasks that we do to a way of living? And what I mean by this was football hasn't always been fun to watch. If you watched them yesterday, it was not a fun watch. Okay. And there is one game that Liverpool fans remember more vividly than any other. I know every other fan is already kind of just sitting there in their hands, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. And it was Istanbul 2005. And for all those people who aren't Liverpool fans, just bear with me for just a moment. And those who don't like football, there is a lesson to be learned here. And it's not about football, so don't worry. Okay. So, but it was to do with my dad. And my dad wasn't a big football fan. Me, it would be me and my mum who would watch the game. And it was more my mum who embedded those values and traditions in me. But if you know anything about this one football game, Liverpool were losing and they were losing badly. It was 3-0 down at half time. So as a, I'm trying to remember, I would have been 14 years old and I hated losing and I hated watching my team lose, and I was angry. So I decided that I didn't want to go and watch it anymore. I, in fact, at half time, I went upstairs and went to go on the computer. And because my dad didn't like football, he wanted to go on the computer. So there was words that he said to me that have stuck to me even yesterday. And I said, you've got to support your team when they are winning and when they are losing. You've got to support your team when they're winning and when they're losing. Now, I sit there and thank my dad today because I saw the most dramatic of turns around in football that day. But I've held on to what he said. And even when my team is losing, which they are at the moment, and it's really sad for me, but I'm going to still watch them 
because not because it's something I do, but because I'm a Liverpool fan, it's a way of living. And as we think about this this morning, how do we move from tasks that we do, whether it's church on a Sunday morning, work, volunteering, how about evangelism or mission? Like, these ways in which we live, so how can they become something from a task to that way of living? Something we do automatically because it's within our bones. It's part of our DNA because it's what makes us us. And we couldn't think about doing life any other way. I want us to start with a bit of scripture this morning that we read. And it's something that Jesus himself quotes. And he quotes it when he gets asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? Because I think this is going to help us answer that question. And when he he gets asked that question, what is the greatest commandment? We see it in Matthew 22. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. But as we do, we're going to go back to where he got that commandment from. And we read it in actually in Deuteronomy 6. And just to give you some context on where we're going, this book of Deuteronomy, it's set after the Israelites have been wandering around the wilderness for 40 years. They reach the edge of the Jordan River. And just before Moses is about to die, their leader who's been taking them on this journey, who took them out of Egypt in the first place, he gives them these words of Deuteronomy. And as we read this book, we need to understand that it is a treaty. And what I mean by a treaty is it's this covenant or promise between God and Israel. And the whole book is written in a way in which we can understand there's a promise between God and Israel. And this promise or this covenant was given to them as they were about to enter in to the promised land. And this, when they were to enter into the promised land, this this book, these words were meant to serve them as a reminder of how to live and how to act in a brand new land. And they were given this promise early on of how they're going to enter into this land to Abraham. And they were about to live out the promise. And these were the words in which God wanted to give to his people about how to live in this promise. And as we, if you were to start reading the book of Deuteronomy, it begins by reminding the people of the power of God. It starts by retelling the story of Exodus, this, this miraculous story of how the Israelites, who were slaves, got taken out of their slavery, overcame what was one of the superpowers of the day in Egypt. And it was to show how God was unmatched. And as we read the plagues, we read about these 10 plagues, about how God was bigger and better than each of the Egyptian gods at the time. Like, we were meant to understand after this first portion of Deuteronomy that God is bigger than any situation we might experience. He is better than we could even imagine. And then we get up to this bit in Deuteronomy 6, which is all about the basic stipulations, the, the, the eyes, like how you dot the eyes and cross the T's about how we live out the promise. And it starts with this. So this is Deuteronomy 6, okay? And we're starting from verse 4, and it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And I want to start off with this. I think this answers the question of who are we? Because we are God's people. We are to love God. That's where we've got to start when we're answering this question, we've lo- we are to love God. And this covenant, this promise between God and the Israelites was based on a relationship. And God has always intended on being in relationship with his people. It started back then when it was to do with the Israelites. And it lives out today for us through Jesus. And sadly, we put barriers in the way. What we read as we continue to read the Bible is how the people of Israel broke the promises. 
They put barriers between them and God. And what as they did, they distanced themselves from God. And in breaking the promises, we see later on that, and we're going to get to this in a moment, about how they ended up going into exile. A time where they were away from the land that they were given and were back in slavery under different people. And we too have made those things in where we've broken promises with God. We've made those times in which we've put God to the side and said, we don't want anything to do with you. We too have forgotten about our relationship with God at times. But it then goes on to say, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. And when we read that the commandments should be on our hearts, I don't know about you, but as I was planning and thinking about this, it brought me to the attention of some words in Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah, it says this, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after the time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. See, these words were very similar to the words that we've just written. And it shows that God is consistent in his promises. Even when we mess up, even when we say, we don't want anything to do with you, he is consistent in his promises towards us. Because when we read what we've seen in Jeremiah, it is talking about how the people were going into exile because of the things that they'd done wrong, the promises that they'd already broken. And then these words then we read, and it gives them hope. It gives them a future to be expectant towards, a time which they know that they're not always going to be in exile, but they're going to be back in relationship with God. And we read these words later on in Hebrews 8. They take a direct quote of what it says in Jeremiah. And the reason why they do is because today we live in the promise of these words. Because today, this was picturing a time in which we would see Jesus and how Jesus died for us. And as he died for us, he shed his blood in making a new promise. And a promise in which we now to be, are being able to be back in relationship with God. See, the, the Hebrew writer knew and explains how Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension has made a brand new promise between God and man. One that has been fulfilled for us today and one that we can live in the hope of. Like we may have messed up. We may have got things wrong. But today we can look to Jesus and see how God has made a promise with us. And that we can live knowing that promise is never going to be wiped out. It can't be blotted out. And there's no need for a new covenant like there was because we've got the best covenant because Jesus has fulfilled our part of the promise too. See, faith is based on relationship and not on tasks. It's not about what you can do to put yourself right with God. It's about what Jesus has done for you and that we get to live in relationship with him. See, God, as we read these verses in Deuteronomy, has always tried to show his people that it's not about what you can do, but it's about what he can do. See, we talk about how in the first portion of Deuteronomy it's shown how God overcame the Egyptians. But today we look about how Jesus overcame death and sin and put it to the cross. See, we might mess up like Israel did. But today we have a better promise because of Jesus. And just like Deuteronomy teaches that God is a God of victories, those prayers that we prayed this morning, we can trust that God is in them and moving through them. Why? Because Jesus cares. And he's shown us how much he cares, but he came to earth. He died a horrific death on a cross to show us how much he loves us. So not only is God the God of the exodus of Egypt, he's also the exodus of our sin. And what exodus means is the exit, the way out that it's the thing that no longer holds us back. So today, I want to encourage you to live in obedience to God. Because obedience is different to living by the tasks. It's different to by living a set of laws and rules. Obedience is all based 
on a relationship. It's based on loving him and being in a relationship with God. Okay, is everyone with me so far? Yeah, so we're going to just take the next few verses, and we're going to see how applying this new covenant, this new promise that Jesus has made with us, okay, and how that can help us understand the salvation that we have in Jesus. Because it says on then, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. See, this word when it says, impress them on your children. How we can understand this is, repeat them to your children. How often are we discussing stories of faith. Maybe, and this might be a challenge for some parents, explain your testimony to your kids. Tell them about where you've been or how God's changed you because I know that parents, just like anybody else, don't want to let their kids know when they were their age what they were up to. Yeah. Young people, this is your opportunity now. Yeah. To ask your parents about how God has moved in their life. Because I think those testimonies, those stories, as I've said already this morning, have power in our lives. And as we discuss that with them, as we discuss Scripture with other people, whether they are our own children, whether they are friends and family, they're going to be the things in which when we repeat it, it reminds us of it. And as we repeat it and talk about it, it becomes so much more natural and easier to do. See, I get that not every person in here, as I've spoken, might have a child. And I'm not just talking specifically about children, but I'm aware that in this room we've got parents, we've got aunties, we've got uncles, grandparents, foster parents, family, friends, and all those people. We should be looking after our kids together. It should be a time in which not only do we think about the children as being literal children, but people who are new in their faith who've just come to know who Jesus is, we should be discussing the things of faith with them, discussing our stories, sharing testimonies, go to life groups, not just to learn about what God says in Scripture, but to share our lives with one another so we can encourage one another, hold each other accountable, pray for one another. These are things in which we do can encourage us. See, it goes on to say in Jeremiah, in that portion that we read a moment ago, it finishes with this in verse 34. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will know know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sin no more. See, God wants everybody to know. Like your brother or your neighbor like this idea that what God is saying is to give us a picture that God wants not just Israel to know who God is, but he wants everybody. And this was his time and his point where he was expanding what God was doing, where it was time where he focused on the people of Israel. This was where he was starting to change it to go, no, this is bigger. Israel was meant to be someone who the other nations would look to and know that I am God. But now I'm doing a new thing. And that new thing was Jesus. And he opened the door for everybody to come and be invited in to be part of God's family. So when we think about who should we impress these commandments on, who should we be repeating these stories to? Well, it means everyone. Even though it refers to children, we can take it today. It's everybody should know the things of faith. And we should share our faith with everyone who will listen. Because this is the mission of God. This is what he wants for his people, to go into all the earth, making disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So wherever and whatever you do, I want to encourage you that this is a commandment. This is the thing in which we've been called and taught to do, to go and share what God wants us to do and to live it out. And this should be not tasks. When I said before about how evangelism can feel like a task. It can feel like it weighs quite heavy on us and we don't want to do it at times. Well, it shouldn't feel like that. Evangelism should be something that comes so naturally to us. It should just be about discussing what God is doing in our lives with our friends and our family. That's how easy it should be. Mission, well, mission is showing God's love 
to other people? Like, how easy is it to love people? Well, I think it, it comes down to if God showed how much he loves us, we can then let that out and love other people. And it should be just as natural as the air that we breathe. See, this should be a way of living. Uh, one of the things that struck me most when I worked in a school was the fact that people would always bring up my faith to me, but not because I would always necessarily go on talking about my faith, even though I made everyone aware that I believed in God and that I believed Jesus died for me. The reason why they would bring it up to me was because they noticed something slightly different to about me than everybody else. And it's not outstandingly different. All it was was I didn't swear. And the fact that I didn't swear, and I can see people nodding their head, is countercultural. It's something that makes us different because it is so normal for everybody in the world to swear. And by making that decision, oh, I don't need to do this. I live by a different culture. I live by a different kingdom. And what I mean by that is I follow Jesus. And because I follow Jesus, I'm going to make different choices with my life, make different decisions. And in making those different decisions, I don't feel like I need to swear. And in not swearing, I had a colleague coming up to me going, I just don't understand. Why, why do you live like this? And as simple as it was, by being countercultural with something simple, it brought about conversations about something bigger. And I think that we can all start taking this and start using this. And it can be in lots of different ways in which you could be countercultural. It might be the fact that in the office you don't gossip. It might be the fact that, do you know what? You're going to go out your way to bless other people by making them a cup of tea. That you will make decisions going, do you know what? How can I show Jesus in this situation and then do it? And it can be as simple as that act of kindness. Or do you know, going, oh, I don't agree with that. So I'm going to stand up for that person that I think you're bullying right now. As much as it might be really difficult to stand against the grain. Because that is what God is encouraging was to do. You see, I'd spoke about obedience before, and it made me think that this idea of obedience and how we live in God's way, God's commandment, this idea of a different kingdom that I have mentioned, and how it's all based on this relationship, not the things that we do. It made me think about my own relationships. It made me think, oh, I'm going to act a certain way. There'll be certain things that I do and don't do based on my relationships with people. I'm going to do things that my wife enjoys because you know what? That's going to make her happy. If I knew something would really upset my wife, well, I know not to do it. Like, it seems really obvious, but I know that every single person in this room works through the basis and the decisions of their actions based on the relationships they most value. And for us, if we really valued our relationship with God, we're going to be thinking, what? What would he have to say about what I'm about to do? What would he say? And do you know what that means? We start following his commandments. We start acting in a way in which is appropriate to him. That's what I really think we can start doing. Because it goes on to then say, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. See, now, Orthodox Jews have taken this really literally. They will have boxes on top of their door step, or on their door frames and will have these words written in it. They will tie them on ribbons on their wrists and they will have them on hats. But I don't, I don't know whether or not the scripture literally meant us to do this in a way that was literal. But I do think it was meant to be said as a way in which it would help us Remember God's commandments. Because as it says, tie them on your symbols of your hands. I really believe what it's meaning is the works of your hands should be something in which resembles God's commandments. As we act and as we do things, it should resemble God's commandments. So it's a, when it says, bind them on your foreheads, well, that is where we start to see from. And the eyes and how we view things and how we understand the world. Well, if we understand that, is we need to understand God's commandments and how we view the world is something that should be working together. Write them on your door frames of your houses. 
Our homes should be a place in where God's commandments are the way in which we live. And then when it says, on your gates, what that referring to is your communities, your cities, the places that go extend across just outside of your home, those places too should be the place in where you're taking God's commandments. See, as we read these words, we're again reminded about how we're meant to be on a mission, which starts with ourselves and how we act and how we view the world, extends to our immediate family, but then goes and into the larger community in which we're a part of. God has always intended us to be some people who shared his mission, shared his love with other people. And it starts with us. So how do we do this? Like, how do we move from tasks we do to a way of living? Now, the first one's going to sound funny with what's coming up. But the first thing I want to say is missions shouldn't be programmed events. Missions shouldn't be programmed events. And before you misunderstand me, I'm not saying I have anything against programmed events because I'm leading one this evening. And I want to encourage all of you to bring the friends and family and everybody involved. But what I do mean is... Those programmed events should be starts of conversations. It should be the, often the times which breaks down the, bro- like the difficult walls that people might have built up. And it might be the ways in which we can break down what their old understanding of what church and Christian life look like by showing them something new. What I am saying is when I say missions shouldn't be programmed events, is it shouldn't solely be a programmed event because it should be something we do naturally day in, day out. It should be something in which you go about in your homes and in your lives on a daily basis. Because wouldn't it be sad if there were no conversations about God for you? Wouldn't it be sad if the only missions you were involved in were those programmed events? Like, mission is meant to be who we are, not just a task that we do. It should be a, a way of living. Like, mission incorporates a whole Christian life, and it should be lived out. And yes, we have a personal relationship with God. And I know often this is the people's biggest phrase when they don't want to do evangelism and mission. And I totally agree. Our our relationship with God is personal. But as we've heard this morning, it's meant to be lived out in community and shared with other people. And that's why church becomes so important. And it's the reason why we want other people to know about God, because they too need to have a personal relationship with him. And if you're only keeping it personal, how will they ever know? So how can you do this? Well, I want to encourage you to think about this as a family. And that might be strange if you don't have an immediate family, but I want to encourage you to then think, yes, immediate family or people whom you're close to, those groups, those people who are close friends, those people who you'd consider like family and volunteer volunteer at local charities, volunteer in the free clothes store, do it as a community of people wanting to participate in seeing God's kingdom move. Think about how you can bless your neighbors. I know that if you were, if any of you remember him, Dave Allen, he would always take a cake to his neighbors. Like how of a simple way of just showing God's love and kindness. Like I've said earlier on, live by different values in work. The values that Jesus his daughters. See, Paul encourages the church in Corinth to be living epistles. And you might never have heard that phrase before, and you might not know what it means, but to be a living epistle means to be the letter from God to the people around you. And it's how God would want to speak to them. That's what Paul's encouraged us to be, that letter from God to them. So we need to tell people who don't know about God, about him. See, missions should simply be who we are as Christians. Another thing I want to say is, as we think that God has made us into one family as a church, and I want to say this, families share values. I started this talk as I spoke about my shared values as a family. I think it's normal that as a family of God, that we ought to have conversations about him with one another, about how he's speaking to us. We should share testimonies of faith with each other. 
God should be part of our everyday conversations, not just on a Sunday. Not in an overcomplicated way, but by using normal language that everyone can feel comfortable with. In ways that even our children would understand. We should include our kids and our young people in mission. Like, get them involved. When you were volunteering, like my parents did, just bring them and get them involved too. Because as we do, we teach them. Because one of the things that I said two weeks ago was some things I know that can't be taught, get caught. And I think volunteering, getting involved in mission is one of those things. That as much as we say the right words, we say the right language, unless they start doing it and have a practical experience for themselves, you just don't get it. And I want to encourage that to anybody who has never experienced what it looks like to be involved in mission. Find somebody who has. I don't mean just mission overseas, but mission on your front door, in your community. Find out people who are doing it and gather around side them to learn about how we do this. And a great place we can do that is starting life groups that is focused on mission, focused on looking outwards, not inwards. A way in which we want to Bless our communities. See, I was reminded of this principle yesterday when we went to the supermarket. And as we did, I saw a mom out with her son on the bike. And he, she was explaining and showing him what it means to ride a bike on the road. Well, where was the kid? He, well, he was riding his bike on the road. And I think this point is he could only learn of what it looks like by doing it with her. And I think sometimes we need to bring people alongside us, whether they are our literal children or whether they are people who are new to faith or they've never been involved in it. We need to teach people and go on a journey alongside them so they know how to do it on their own. Because like I've said, values aren't taught, but they're embodied. They're lived out. And that's how we understand them. And that's what it means to impress them on our kids. Like, And I want to come to our third point. And it's faith is based on relationship. I've mentioned this already, but I want us to move from this merely understanding that our Christian life is tasks and is actually a way of living because it's all about relationship. The passage started that we read this morning, underlined it's about a relationship with God. And Jesus came into the world so that we may have a relationship with him. And today we can live in relationship with God thanks to Jesus and through his spirit. And his spirit that is living in us, reminding us, helping us, changing us, and moving us. And it's without the relationship, this can feel like another list of things to do. But once we understand that it's all based on relationship with God, a God who loves us, a God that has invited us back to himself, the rules just fade away. And it just becomes about the relationship that you have with God. And we can grow in our relationship with God as we read scriptures, as we listen to worship, as we discuss Him as a community, as we pray with Him individually, and as we serve with others. These are ways in which we can practically do to see this happen. Like, just imagine this is how we live. Imagine this is what we did. This was an idea of family on mission. And as I finish, I just want to inspire you with a story. This is a real charity called Gotta Have Soul. And this is a charity in the U.S. And it was started after a five-year-old went to a homeless shelter with his mum. And whilst he was there, he was devastated when he saw that children just like him didn't have shoes that would fit them. And because they didn't have shoes that would fit them, it meant that they didn't go to school because they were sharing shoes with the rest of the family. And those shoes that might not have fit them when they went to school, well, they got bullied for wearing them. And this five-year-old couldn't understand it. He couldn't get to grips with the idea that people with just a normal, everyday commodity, something that we take for granted, these people didn't have. So by the time he was 12 years old, he started this charity, Gotta Have Soul. Something that he's been leading now for over five years. 
And I read something yesterday. As a 17-year-old, he was the CEO of a charity. And this was it. Gotta have soul. A charity that gives brand new trainers to children and young people in homeless shelters so they can attend school. It started with a simple story of a family going to a local community, saving them. And what it ended up being is something that he actually has got an award from the president because he started a charity that has had a nation impact. Like how amazing would it be to have stories of faith just like this here? Because we want to get our children, we're going to get people who don't know about mission involved in mission. And as they do, they can see something about the compassion of God for other people. See, I shared this story because I believe it shows something about how we can actually apply this to our lives. A simple idea that meets the need of those people around us and it gave people dignity. And even at the age of five, he understood this idea. And I think so often we want to shelter our kids and we want to protect them of the harms and the difficulties of the world that we never do anything this because it feels so risky. But I really believe it can be something that can transform not just their faith, but our faith too. See, I just want to ask you, and I want to finish with this question. How are you going to partner with God to do this? How are you going to partner to God to do this? As I finish today, I I do want to give people an opportunity to become a part of God's family, maybe for the very first time. Because you've heard something today about how you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, and you've heard something about him, and thought, I need to be a part of that family. A family where God has made a promise with you through Jesus that he will never break, and that you can't ruin either. That it's solely focused on him. And if that's you, I want to pray this prayer, and I want to invite you to pray it with me. But before we do, and before we pray this together, I also want to invite everybody. I want to invite everybody who wants to be a part of this mission to also say this prayer. And as we do, I think because mission is so close to God's heart, it's the very thing in which we were commanded to do. Because he wants people to come to know him. He wants not just always change, but our communities, our cities, Southport changed. So if you want to be involved in partnering with God, I want to invite you to stand up as we pray a prayer together. I'm not saying that because it's an easy thing to do. But I know it's difficult. But I also understand that living out our faith isn't an easy thing to do. And if we can't do it in here, if we can't make a decision to stand up in here, how are we ever going to do that outside these walls? So if you want to partner with God, to see God's kingdom come on this earth, I want to encourage you to stand up. You might be praying this prayer for the first time or the millionth time. And that is fine. That is okay. Because every day we've got to make a decision to follow Jesus. Yeah, we just thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. I'm sorry for the times that I've broken your promises, pushed you aside, and wanted nothing to do with you. Thank you that you wanted me to be a part of your family. Holy Spirit, help me to become more like you. I pray this week I will be aware of opportunities to share your compassion and your love to those people around me. Help me to be your hands and feet and go places where you want me to go and to do the things you want me to do. Amen. While every eye is closed and every head is bowed. If, you, if you've made that decision to follow Jesus and wanted to be a part of his mission for the very first time today, I just want to encourage you to just raise your hand. We'd just like to give something to you. If you're watching 
online. I just want to encourage you to just put a hands emoji and our online host will let you know and give some details to get something out to you as well. Yeah, we just thank you, God, for what you've done, how you've moved in us, that you're changing us. And Holy Spirit, we just pray that you would continue to change us this morning. You make yourself known to us. Amen.
Miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Lord, we just thank you that you made a way that we can have a relationship with you. And we just pray, Lord, that as we go about our days, as the week ahead, Lord, that we can know you by our side and that we can share that with the people that we meet. Amen. Tea and coffee upstairs, if you want to go upstairs. This isn't easy.